Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Amna Nawaz. I'm the chief correspondent at the PBS NewsHour. Delighted to be here today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Particularly delighted to be in conversation with these three wonderful leaders. You all know Anya Manuel, of course. Also, Karen Pierce, ambassador of the United Kingdom to the United States. Please join me in welcoming her. And, of course, Arthur Sinodinos, the ambassador of Australia to the United States. Welcome to you both. We're speaking at a critical time, of course. You just heard from Kurt Campbell about the um, meetings taking place, the Osman meetings this week, also the first defense minister's meeting between uh, Australia, UK, and the US. Um, so I'd like to start very broadly from each of you, if we can, just to hear from each of your country's perspectives how you view the Indo-Pacific right now. What, is, what do you see as the single greatest threat to stability? Ambassador Pierce, why don't you kick us off? Uh, well, thank you uh, very much indeed, and thanks to Aspen for having me here. Um, I think we all agree that the Indo-Pacific is only going to get more important. It never stopped being important. Huge percentage, something like 70% of the world's trade uh, goes through the Indo-Pacific and has done uh, for a while. But I think it's the geostrategic uh, and the political, politico-military factors that are making it uh, so relevant at the moment, along with, of course, the growing assertiveness uh, of China in the 21st century uh, and the growing participation uh, of India uh, on the world stage. So for those reasons, it's an incredibly uh, important area for all of us. Uh, for the UK specifically, uh, we are increasing uh, our engagement with the Indo-Pacific across the board, and that's also in the Western uh, Indian Ocean as well as uh, in the Pacific uh, and right the way uh, in between. Uh, and we are doing that because of the uh, indivisibility between the economy and security factors in that very important area. There are some very important democracies uh, in that area uh, who struggle a bit uh, in the face of some of the geostrategic headwinds uh, that Kirk Campbell was talking about, and they're our friends, uh, and we want to support them. Uh, we want to increase the connective tissue uh, of UK engagement with the Indo-Pacific region and with the countries. Uh, to that end, we have applied to join CPTPP. We are putting more money into helping Pacific Island states uh, on climate, uh, and we are doing more militarily uh, in terms of stability and goodwill. Uh, we had the carrier strike group last year. We are sending a literal response group uh, to the Western uh, Indian Ocean, and we are thickening up uh, our relationships with, with all those countries, uh, including India. Um, what do I see as the greatest threat? I think Kurt uh, said it very well. Um, I think, though, that my, if you like, my favorite uh, analysis of risk uh, that I saw uh, somewhere once uh, was that when bad things happen, we take bad decisions. Uh, and I do think we risk uh, miscalculation and misunderstanding uh, at the moment because we don't have quite as many mechanisms as I think we need to be able to deal with whatever uh, might come out of Chinese activity. And if you compare that to what we had with the Soviet Union in the Cold War, uh, I think you can see there's a deficit there. Thank you for that. We're going to dig into a lot of those in more detail in our, the time we have, but um, Ambassador Cindy Dinos, why don't you yeah, give us uh, Australia's Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, excuse my voice, I've had two ministers here, so there's been a lot of running around. Um, Look, uh, for us, obviously, we're tethered to the Indo-Pacific. We can't actually move the country anywhere else. So for us, we have a very great stake in the peace and stability of the region. And, and in many ways, um, as Karen said, with the economic centre of gravity moving increasingly to the Asia-Pacific, the rise of China, uh, both in an economic sense, political sense, military sense, or whatever, um, in some ways, the great challenge is how we... Um, adapt to the rise of a strong and powerful China, which is in everybody's, it's to everybody's benefit. We have a strong and powerful China. 
It's been the greatest poverty reduction initiative in history, what's happened in China. But the importance of this is that for us, particularly in Australia, who've had the benefit of strong alliances with powers which essentially have very similar values and interests, is how do you adapt that order in the region to the rise of such a powerful country in a way that helps to preserve important elements of that order. So from our perspective, the continued engagement of the US in the region is vital, not just in a defence sense, but in the economic sense. And for us, in recent times, under the new government, there's been more of an attempt to restart dialogue with Beijing, just as the US is having dialogue with Beijing, in order to stabilise our relationship. We went through a period there where increasingly we were taking decisions which they didn't like, but which were decisions profoundly in our national interest. And we will continue to stand up for our national interest. And part of our national interest uh, is to make sure that that global rules-based order, which has underwritten our peace and prosperity since the Second World War, is actually maintained. Yes, renovated, refurbished as necessary to accommodate changes in the world. But that's what this is all about. This is why Australia, for example, is one of the largest contributors, non-NATO contributors, to the effort in Ukraine. Because we see the stakes there. We see the, the links between what happens there and what happens in our region. The idea that large states can just invade small states in defiance of the UN Charter and everything else. We don't want that law of the jungle. We want that global rules-based order to continue. And it's vital for us that the US continues to underpin that order and is uh, actively engaged in the architecture of that order um, in its various manifestations. So for us, going forward, we're quite optimistic. We're stabilising the relationship with China. We're seeking to establish lines of communication after a few years where we've been in the doghouse. Now, in doing that, we're not compromising or changing our strategic or policy settings. We want a more normal relationship with China. But for us, it doesn't mean walking out of AUKUS. It doesn't mean walking out of the US alliance. Um, it means working closely with countries with which we had long and strong relationships, like the UK, and we really welcome what the UK is doing in the Indo-Pacific, very important. Uh, and in the AUKUS context, can I say, the UK is very much an active partner, and its heft, particularly punching above its weight in areas like science and technology, is going to be very important to the elements of AUKUS going forward. And we'll, we'll discuss it later, but we had some interesting discussions around that in the last couple of days with the US and the UK. We'd love to hear more about that. Now, Anya, you're not speaking for the US government, but you can give us that perspective. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's all of you, actually. Yeah. Can you hear me? This one's not working. There. Is it? No, it is. Yeah. Wonderful. There you go. Thank you, Amna. You know, Kurt laid out perfectly Biden, the Biden administration's strategy Indo, in the Indo-Pacific and what's at stake. As a private sector citizen, I think I can paint a picture more clearly of what we're terrified of. And I think it's safe to say that it's not really an imminent invasion of mainland China into Taiwan, but it is an accident. And whenever I talk to the Defense Department, I'm on the, in the private sector, I advise them, I don't speak for the Pentagon, but the worry is that there is so much military kit flying around and floating around uh, in the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, that ultimately an accident will happen. Let me just give you a couple of points. Uh, this summer, the Chinese declared the Taiwan Strait not international waters. The biggest applause line at the 20th Century Communist Party Congress was when Xi Jinping said, we want reunification with Taiwan. We want it to be peaceful. But if it's not, we'll use force if necessary. Biggest applause line. You have had something like 600 incursions by Chinese fighter jets over the median line in the Taiwan Strait. After Nancy Pelosi's visit this summer, the Chinese exercised not an invasion of Taiwan, but a pretty extreme version of a blockade of Taiwan. And they managed to exercise so effectively that actually planes didn't go. Airlines decided not to fly anymore. Commercial ships couldn't get in and out. And unfortunately, this is now a tool that the Chinese government can ratchet up at will. And what's the US going to do? What's Australia and the UK going to do? Are we really going to go to war over a military exercise? Probably not. So to me, that's what I worry most about. 
I know that Secretary Austin and others worry about it as well, which is why one of the most important things to come out of the Biden Xi visit was this restarting of dialogues with the Chinese. And you said it, Karen, you know, with the Soviet Union, all the way through the Cold War, we had great mechanisms for deconflicting. Here, we really don't. So Lloyd Austin talked to his counterpart recently. He talked about restarting those dialogues, especially at the mill-to-mill -mill level, which is the most critical level and a direct line, ideally between our Indo-PACOM commander and their Eastern Command in China. Nothing doing. And that deeply worries me because it's only a matter of time before an accident happens and we'll all have a crisis on our hands. So Ambassador Pierce, what, what about that? I mean, I, I want to remind folks of what the UK Prime Minister recently said about needing to evolve the UK-China relationship, right? He said that the golden era of those relations are over. When it comes to this trilateral agreement, when it comes to AUKUS and the threats and the very real concerns Anya just raised, how do you view that? What does that evolving relationship or evolving approach look like with China? Um, so I think you shouldn't think of AUKUS as, as a Chinese-specific uh, measure. It's, it's deepening this connective tissue that we were talking about, uh, and it's a mechanism for cooperation between three of the Five Eyes partners, uh, and it's a mechanism to help enhance security, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, working very closely uh, with Australia, and you'll have seen Lloyd Austin's uh, announcement yesterday about more rotational uh, US forces uh, working with Australia, which, which we strongly support. Um, it's very important that we develop these alliances and we thicken them up so they're actually useful, so that they can contribute uh, to peace and stability. I do worry, as, as Anya said, I do worry about this point about lack of Chinese military uh, contacts in, in particular. Um, to give you an example, when President Putin uh, threatened the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine, we could go to manuals that the Russians had given us that set out the Russians' view of tactical nuclear weapons. To the best of my knowledge, there is nothing comparable with the Chinese. There's no baseline that we could use to pro do a proper evaluation of the risks if, as Annie said, something goes wrong. And I would appeal to the Chinese. I do think we need to put more emphasis on this. We need those conversations on a politico-military basis so we can avoid miscalculation. Ambassador Sinodinos, can you take us inside some of the meetings this week on, on a key part of implementation of AUKUS? Uh, obviously, the submarine deal got a lot of attention. Um, and how that's going to be implemented, whether or not the, what I believe is still the deadline for a plan by March of 2023, are you confident that can still be hit, and how? Yeah, um, look, it was a very productive and consequential meeting. It was the first meeting of the defense ministers under the AUKUS umbrella. Um, they discussed pillar one, which is the nuclear-powered submarines. Um, that is crystallizing in terms of the optimal pathway. Um, there are two, two issues. One is what the final design looks like, and the other issue is the interim capabilities while you build up to a capacity to deliver the actual submarines themselves. And so there's a lot of work that's gone into that over the last 12 months, and they are on track to announce in the first quarter of next year. Um, I think you will see that the final uh, elements of this will involve genuine trilateral cooperation. I mean, the whole point of this, uh, it's very much a capability pact. It's about how we work more closely together around the information sharing, technology, integration of industrial bases, and the, and the, and the like. Pillar two, advanced capabilities. This is about emerging and foundational technologies in AI, machine learning, cyber, uh, undersea warfare other than subs, uh, hypersonics, electromagnetic warfare, etc. Now, what's happening there is, uh, uh, Secretary Austin made it very clear early on, he wanted consultation of the warfighters so we can bring forward how some of these foundational technologies can be implemented sooner rather than later in a way that also helps, uh, if you like, uh, complement our capability over the next few years. 
uh, people like uh, Aquilino, the Indo-PACOM commander, they're, they're not building up for something uh, sort of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, a force in 2029, 30 or 32. He's thinking about how do I build up my forces over the next two or three or four years? And therefore, there's a whole focus under this pillar too about what capabilities can quickly be brought in. And interestingly enough, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, where there's been this acceleration of bringing uh, new, new uh, sort of applications onto the field sooner rather than later. The way corners have been cut, the way there's been improvisation, the use of off-the-shelf solutions rather than you know, the old defence approach of if it's not invented here, we're not going to adopt it. Um, it's, a, it's actually sped up this process of thinking about capability development and acquisition and how you accelerate it. If I can, back on pillar one just for a moment, though, what does reaching that timeline mean? Does that mean involving U.S. production in some way or solely relying on us building up I mean, I mean ultimately, the, the, the submarines will be built in Australia, but what I'm saying is that, that the way the process is coming together, uh, it'll be a significant trilateral effort. Um, we can't say any more until governments have had a chance to look over uh, the, the results of the discussions over the last few days. Anya, what about this, the submarine deal? I mean, everyone knows it hit a hurdle, AUKUS hit hurdles early, specifically because of this deal. What does it say to you about U.S. priorities that AUKUS went through even be despite those hurdles? Yeah. It says that Kurt Campbell is a great <laughs> mover of things <laughs> in the U.S. system, and I think this is a very important deal. But I think it shows, let me just lift our sights a little bit, because I think it shows that as I said in the beginning, the tectonic plates of the international system are shifting. And because China has showed us a far more aggressive side recently, as much as we all, I agree with you, Arthur, want China to rise peacefully, want China to be successful, want it to be prosperous, you know, they're scaring us. And so you're seeing a shifting of alliances, the quad, which is something you couldn't even talk about when I was in the State Department a decade ago, now suddenly, you know, they can't get enough of the quad to the point where they're kind of terrifying ASEAN. In addition to AUKUS, the number of exercises that are going on that are really uh, pretty concrete with our both our European allies and our Asian allies, like Pitch Black, the Air Force exercise that just happened, I think had French participants, UK participants, others, pretty impressive. You've had a British carrier strike group over in the Pacific, you've had a German frigate, so it's, it, AUKUS is, is getting all the attention, but what's important is, is you see the alliance system shifting, and I think Kurt and Joe talked about it too, how even Japan and South Korea, those eternal arch enemies, are starting to set aside their differences because of their worries. Anya, can you see a little bit more on the advanced capabilities? portion of this. Ambassador Tintin has touched on a number of them that undersea robotic systems, quantum technologies, advanced cyber capabilities. Where, where are we on implementation of all of those? Within the Defense Department? Um, I would say, as an outsider's perspective, I see the U.S. Pentagon struggling mightily to work with and on these new technologies. But our system at the Pentagon is set up for 20th century timelines and 20th century processes. So everything takes too long, Look, said from someone who lives in Silicon Valley. But we talk, we say quantum, we say AI, we throw out these catchwords, but are we really doing enough? Probably not. And, but maybe I can turn it back to Arthur, who kn knows specifically what's happening with those three. <laughs> Well, look, what's happening is identifying specific projects, and then there's a senior advisor who's been put into the Pentagon, a senior advisor to Secretary Austin, Abe Denmark, whose job is to actually uh, help drive the process through the Pentagon. Now, it's a very complex place, as you say, but they recognise they've got to accelerate various pathways, and they're setting up new organisations to do that. Uh, <coughs> Pardon me. In the process of doing that, they recognise they've got existing fiefdoms that they have to bring along, and part of Abe's job is how do you uh, herd the cats in that sense. The other part of this is that the Congress is taking an interest in industrial base integration, and so they're keen to find ways to also reduce the red tape around this. So I think this is a pincer movement, both uh, from the administration perspective and the Congress uh, perspective. Ambassador Pierce, you've mentioned uh, the interest in deepening 
both trade and, and security ties with other Indo-Pacific allies, right? Um, I, I want to ask you about India as well. So talk a little bit about the UK perspective on engaging uh, India on, on security issues, vis-a-vis -vis security and stability in the region. Um, I think if I'm honest, I have to start by saying uh, the UK-India relationship is complicated. Uh, India is a very important strategic partner. Uh, we have a very large Indian diaspora uh, back in the UK. We now have the first Indian origin prime minister uh, of the UK, which, which is pretty uh, significant in social uh, and other terms. Um, we want to deepen that strategic uh, relationship with India. Uh, Arthur mentioned how China had lifted billions of um, millions of people uh, out of poverty. Uh, the same is also true of India. Uh, and of course, India is a democracy. It occupies a really important place in world affairs. And as Kurt said, it has a unique strategic uh, character. And we're mindful uh, of all of that. Um, we want to deepen our trade cooperation. We're talking to India about a trade deal. We want to deepen our politico-military uh, cooperation. That includes defense equipment. I think we'd like to modernize uh, the whole relationship while mindful of some very important historical factors uh, that are hard, to be honest, often hard uh, to overcome. Uh, but as you say, having Rishi Sunak and talking about these evolutionary leaps in UK policy with the whole area to thicken up uh, that connective tissue uh, is really important. We're very interested in cooperating with India in the Indian Ocean specifically uh, on maritime conservancy. Uh, that's very important. Some of the pollution uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, we want to work with India and other partners to combat. Uh, and we want to work with them on things like patrolling uh, and security in that very important area, not least because so much of world trade uh, goes through that ocean. You mentioned pollution, and it brings me to the critical point of climate change, which I know you have all mentioned as well. I'm curious to hear from each of you, is there room to add climate to the AUKUS portfolio to engage partners on that as well? Uh, Ambassador Sinodinos, would you like to kick us off? Well, at the OSMIN meeting, the 2 plus 2 talks before AUKUS, uh, climate was discussed. There was a third session in the afternoon, uh, and that was largely devoted to climate. And the purpose of that was to think about the national security challenges that climate is raising for all of us. The new Australian government has raised our NDC contribution, 43% by 2030, taking other measures. But we also recognise the impact climate change is having in our region, in the Pacific Islands. We're taking action to help them with both mitigation and adaptation. So issues that came up specifically were, you know, the fact that some of these islands, it's becoming existential. Will there be issues around refugee flows? What will happen to exclusive economic zones, depending on uh, sea level rise? Um, what do we do about water security, which is being compromised in many of these places? So um, to have you know, the defence people in the room, as well as, if you like, the foreign affairs people in the room, talking about how we grapple with this now is taking it to a whole new level of engagement, I think, and really thinking about how the national security apparatus adapts, not just in the sense of humanitarian and disaster relief, but also what other actions we have to take. The final peg of this is that after the election when Prime Minister Albanese went to the Quad meeting in Tokyo, he and Joe Biden had, uh, President Biden had a bilateral. Uh, one of the agreements out of that was for a leaders level uh, climate statement between Australia and the US, uh, which will complement the net zero partnership we've got. And that hopefully will be the subject of discussions next year when President Biden is in Australia for the Quad. Anya, would you like to add to that? And then Ambassador Pierce, to you. Yeah, I just want to dig in a little more because this is such an important point because we talk about climate often as separate from national security. But as you already said, Arthur, it makes all of the security issues worse. The refugee flows from Bangladesh into India because of climate change are somewhere in the range of 15 to 18 million already. As you know, because your family hails from that part of the world, 50% of the water resources in Asia are stuck in the Tibetan Plateau, and it flows down into India, Pakistan, and China, those great friends. 
right? <laughs> you said that you know, sea level rise will make it harder to even harder to figure out where are those atolls in the South China Sea. So all of the issues we worry about are going to be made worse by this. So clearly it has to be on the agenda. Having said that, I um, worry a little that we start these partnerships and they start with one purpose and then we add on everything else. If you look at the Quad, which has been an enormous success, it started as a conversation, not an alliance, but it started as a conversation about security between those four important countries. It has now, when you look at the list of what's discussed under the Quad ministerials, it's pretty much everything under the sun. So there's a part of me that thinks, let's make sure we have some priorities and then discuss the right issues in the right forum. Ambassador Pierce? Oh, I couldn't agree more with Anya, but um, that's true of every single international meeting, sadly. So it's kind of human or at least bureaucratic nature uh, to go in that direction. Uh, I remember being in the Security Council at the UN when we had the first ever climate security debate in the Security Council, and we were absolutely astounded by the number of countries that wanted to speak. Uh, I think we were up to 57, which at the time was the largest ever, and the numbers largely came uh, from the Pacific countries, uh, and particularly the Pacific Island states. And uh, they have seen the importance of climate, as Arthur uh, and Anya described, to their existence, not just to their security, long before we did. And I think, in all honesty, we have collectively been a bit slow to catch up with the issues. However, now, there is good appreciation of the fact that these island states have to deal with a surface area that, if it were a country, uh, would be pretty huge. We do not yet have the right international financial instruments, I think, to help them manage green finance and to deal with the fact that they've got to cover both land and water measures for conservancy, but also for resilience. <coughs> One of the things that came out of COP26 uh, was this focus uh, on adaptation, on helping them uh, be more resistant uh, to disasters, uh, but also helping them to adapt uh, some of the farming and forestry methods that will help protect the environment. And of course, out of COP27 uh, came the very important loss and damage fund, uh, which the US was instrumental uh, in achieving. It's not enough, and we have to keep going. I think the, the green finance part is genuinely uh, complicated when it comes to smaller countries, but there is now much greater recognition that we need to help the Pacific Island states and others uh, get to grips with that. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that this is exactly what pillar three of the AUKUS uh, arrangement was designed to deal with. Uh, these wider prosperity, uh, economic and security issues and how they are all intertwined and to find ways of cooperating uh, beyond the three AUKUS partners with the countries of the region and with others like the French, like the Germans, like the European Union's Japan and Korea. You know, we talked about India, but I wanted to ask each of you about Japan as well. Um, because there were, you mentioned the Quad, obviously, which Japan is a part of, but there were reports um, earlier this year Japan was being asked to consider joining AUKUS. Those were shot down by both Tokyo and, and the White House here. But there are those who argue, you know, when you look at how Japan has changed its security posture, um, increasing its military budget and, and loosening restrictions on weapons development and so on, that it's made it an increasingly important actor in the Indo-Pacific. So I want to put to each of you, should AUKUS consider becoming JAUKUS? Um, <coughs> excuse my voice. Um, we've heard about FORCUS, we've heard about JAUKUS. Um, <coughs> look, at this stage, um, Pillar 1, the subs, is very much a trilateral deal. Pillar 2, the advanced capabilities in due course, there will be scope, I think, potentially to engage other countries in a subset of some of the technologies because uh, it's a capability pact. Um, 
the, the thing about Japan, just to step back from AUKUS for a bit, is they they are standing up in terms of military and security matters. Uh, Abe provided great leadership to the region. So going forward, uh, we think that will continue. They'll increase their military spending. They'll be more forward-leaning. Um, as part of OSMIN, they're going to be more involved in force posture initiatives pardon me, in northern Australia. Um, I think it's a case of there are lots of overlapping groups, and I think that's fine because uh, differentiation and, as uh, Annie was saying, prioritisation is, is important. Uh, but I agree with everything uh, Arthur said about Japan and Japan's increasing strategic importance and also engagement uh, makes me wish I hadn't failed uh, my Japanese language exam uh, on my first posting in the diplomatic service. Um, there are groupings in the UN, loose informal groupings, uh, where um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan and the US get together. Uh, as the UK, we sometimes uh, join them, sometimes join uh, the EU sometimes do it in coordination with others. Uh, so those groups exist. I think philosophically, it's good that you have lots of different groups. Um, but in terms of working more closely with Japan, particularly militarily uh, and on politico-military issues, uh, yes, absolutely. And one important manifestation of that has been in G7, uh, where spurred on by the Ukraine conflict, you have seen G7 this year uh, become far more cohesive, uh, far more of an actor right across the agenda, political, security, and economic uh, than ever before. And of course, Japan is a very important member of that. Anya, to you. Yeah, I'll just add two sentences because a lot has been said. I think the important thing to consider here, how much there has been a sea change in Japanese attitudes to their own pacifism, to how they see their own role in the Indo-Pacific and how they deal with their friends and allies in that region. And it's very similar to what Joe said about India. You used to go to India and you'd say, oh, China is our great partner. And at the cocktail party, I think you said, though, they'd say, but we're terrified of China. The Japanese you used to go to Japan and they'd say, well, you know, China is our, our economic partner and it's very important. And everyone was making lots of money in China. And recently, every time I go to Japan, uh, the tone is much more worried. I just have one final question for each of the ambassadors, and then I'd love to open it up to the room for questions as well for a few minutes. Um, and that is on some comments by President Biden that despite the US policy of strategic amb ambiguity, um, President Biden has repeatedly said that US troops would defend Taiwan if China attacks. And so I'd love to put to both of you, would you say the same of your nation's troops? Uh, I think UK policy towards Taiwan hasn't, hasn't changed. The important thing is that there is peace, security, and stability uh, across the Taiwan Straits, uh, and that there shouldn't be any unilateral uh, change to that. And Anya uh, referred earlier to the Chinese reaction um, when Speaker Pelosi visited uh, Taiwan. Um, we do not have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but we do have a very productive uh, trading relationship. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that Taiwan participates in the WTO, World Trade Organization, as Chinese Taipei. So there are ways of, of developing uh, participation without crossing status or diplomatic uh, thresholds. And I think it was a pity that a way wasn't found for Taiwan to be able to be part of the WHO uh, efforts on, on the pandemic, because they had uh, some very interesting uh, contributions. Um, but in terms of politico-military, um, our, our position has not changed. Uh, the focus should be on reducing tensions across the straits. Thank you for that. Yeah, look, we're very much a status quo power when it comes to the Taiwan issue. Um, everybody knows what everybody's red lines are on this. And so our efforts and the efforts, I think, of the US and others uh, on helping to give Taiwan space along the lines of what uh, Karen just described. Um, but we're not sort of contemplating scenarios other than doing everything we can to try and preserve a peaceful approach to the issue and working together to encourage, you know, 
if in due course Taiwan wanted to have discussions with Beijing about the future, well, that and and that was done in a non-coercive way. That's their that's their business, but we're not in the business of trying to change the status quo. Thank you. I would yeah. just add, as someone who doesn't live in Washington, D.C., but dips in here periodically, I would wish that policymakers, and especially our friends in Congress, would be a little more quiet on Taiwan. We're just being very loud, and we're not carrying that big a stick. So if we could reverse that ratio, that would be great. I feel like I have about a dozen follow-up questions to that, and no time. <laughs> but uh, we do have a few minutes for questions from, from the audience, so let's open it up. Yes, please. Good morning, Jane Harmon, Aspen trustee. Excellent conversation, building on the excellent conversation between Kurt and Joe. Um, it's complicated. Karen, you're right. It's complicated. So my question is, is the frame that uh, uh, President Biden sometimes use, uses and others that we're talking about democracy versus autocracy useful, or is it, in fact, harmful? Um, look, um, I, I think we have to go back to the election, or the run-up to the election here in the US in 2020. And what President Biden was talking about was not just the example of American power, but the power of America's example. And he talked about how it was important for America to make sure that it speaks in a way which is consistent with the founding vision of the country, something he feels very strongly about. And he feels that an important part of what Joe and I once christened as soft power is that example of the US, because that example underpins its moral authority Leave aside military and security issues, it's moral authority when it comes to pursuing that global rules-based order that we, we, we talked about. So for us, those values that underpin that global rules-based order are actually very important to all of us. Now, it's true that in the Asia-Pacific region, you get countries with different political systems. So we're not saying to those countries, you've got to have regime change because our values say you're not a liberal democracy. But what we are saying is that the values we espouse around transparency, the rule of law, respect for human rights and whatever, we believe that's the best basis for having a stable global rules-based order. And um, we don't talk about it the way the, the president does, but it, there's a lot of continuity, I think, between that. Karen. It appears we'll give you the final word here. Uh, we do talk about it in the same way as the, the president. Uh, we talk about open societies. Uh, but as Arthur says, that's not saying your system uh, doesn't work and must change. Uh, I remind everybody that in the British system, we did have the golden era uh, with China. It's, it's the um, assertiveness and the increasing autocracy uh, that is the problem, that is driving the world, as the UN Secretary General has said, to have two parallel systems, one that's open, look at the internet, and one that's closed so that the people can't access information. Now, it's no secret which we're on the side of. Uh, and interestingly, last year was the um, 80th anniversary of the Atlantic Charter. And when we went back and looked at the original uh, Atlantic Charter from 1941, it was all about the values that open societies bring, but how that translates into very tangible benefits for ordinary citizens. And I think that focus uh, often gets lost. It's all about transparency. It's about cooperation. It's very closely linked to open markets. Um, so we, we don't make any apology for agreeing with the president. Uh, but as Arthur said, it isn't a threat. It's about what will ultimately help the ordinary citizen most. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Ambassador Karen Pierce, Arthur Cididinos, and Anya Manuel.